proteins, like written languages or computer codes, have a high degree of specificity. The function of the whole depends upon the precise arrangement of the individual parts. But what produces the precise sequencing of amino acids that gives rise to the specific shapes and functions of proteins? During the 1950s and 60s, discoveries about protein structure forced biologists to confront this mystery. Dean Kenyon believed he could solve it. In his book, Biochemical Predestination, Kenyon and his co-author, Gary Steinman, proposed an intriguing theory. Kenyon wrote, Life might have been biochemically predestined by the properties of attraction that exist between its chemical parts, particularly between amino acids in proteins. At the time that biochemical predestination came out, I and my uh, co-author were totally convinced that we had the scientific explanation for origins. Kenyon proposed that the chemical properties of the amino acids caused them to be attracted to each other, forming the long chains that became the first proteins, the most important components in the living cell. And this meant that life was effectively inevitable, predestined by nothing more than chemistry. Many scientists embraced Kenyon's ideas, and over the next 20 years, biochemical predestination became a best-selling text on the theory of chemical evolution. Yet five years after the book's publication, Kenyon quietly began to doubt the plausibility of his own theory. It was during that whole period of time that my doubts about certain aspects of the evolutionary account became apparent. When coming into contact with a powerful counter-argument given to me by one of my students, and I could not refute that counter-argument, Kenyon was challenged to explain how the first proteins could have been assembled without the help of genetic instructions. In living cells today, chains of amino acids are not formed directly by forces of attraction between their parts, the scenario Kenyon envisioned on the early Earth. Instead, another large molecule within the cell stores instructions for sequencing the amino acids in proteins. It is called DNA. Initially, Kenyon believed that proteins could have formed directly from amino acids without any DNA assembly instructions. And, and that's why so many scientists were excited about his theory. But the more he and others learned about the properties of amino acids and proteins, the more he began to doubt that proteins could self-assemble without DNA. In DNA, Kenyon encountered a molecule with a property he could not explain through natural processes or locked securely within its double helix structure is a wealth of information in the form of precisely sequenced chemicals that scientists represent with the letters A, C, T, and G. In a written language, information is communicated by a precise arrangement of letters. In the same way, the instructions necessary to assemble amino acids into proteins are conveyed by the sequences of chemicals arranged along the spine of the DNA. This chemical code has been called the language of life, and it is the most densely packed and elaborately detailed assembly of information in the known universe. Like other scientists working on the origin of life, Kenyon realized he had two choices. Either he had to explain where these genetic assembly instructions came from, or he had to explain how proteins could have arisen directly from amino acids without DNA in the primordial oceans. And in the end, he realized he could do neither. It's an enormous problem how you could get together in one tiny submicroscopic volume of the primitive ocean all of the uh, hundreds of different molecular components you would need in order for a self-replicating cycle to be established. And so my doubts about whether amino acids could order themselves into uh, meaningful biological sequences on their own without pre-existing genetic material being present just reached, uh, I guess for me, the intellectual breaking point uh, sometime near the, the end of the decade of the 70s. As Kenyon reevaluated his theory, new biochemical discoveries further weakened his conviction that amino acids could have organized themselves into proteins. 
The more I conducted my own studies, including a period of time at NASA Ames Research uh, Center, uh, the more it became apparent that there were multiple difficulties with uh, the chemical evolution account. And uh, further uh, experimental work showed that amino acids do not have the ability to order themselves uh, into any biologically meaningful sequences. Faced with mounting difficulties in his own theory and a growing body of scientific data about the importance of DNA, Kenyon was forced to confront the absolute necessity of genetic information. The more I thought about the alternative that was being presented in the criticism and the enormous problem that all of us who worked on this field had neglected to address, the problem of the origin of genetic information itself, then I really had to reassess my whole uh, position regarding, uh, regarding origins. For Dean Kenyon, a new question became the focus of his search for life's origin. What was the source of the biological information in DNA? If one could get at the origin of the uh, messages, the encoded messages within the living machinery, then you would really be on to something far more intellectually satisfying than this chemical evolution theory. Yet Kenyon realized that he faced a narrowing set of options. By the 1970s, most researchers had rejected the idea that the information necessary to build the first cell originated by chance alone. To understand why, consider the difficulty of generating just two lines of Shakespeare's play Hamlet by dropping Scrabble letters onto a tabletop then considered that the specific genetic instructions required to build the proteins in even the simplest one-celled organism would fill hundreds of pages of printed text. Of course, a serious origin of life biologists did not believe that life had arisen by chance alone. Instead, they envisioned natural selection acting on random variations among chemicals to produce the first life. But there was a problem with this proposal. By definition, natural selection could not have functioned before the existence of the first living cell. For it can only act upon organisms capable of replicating themselves, cells equipped with DNA that pass on their genetic changes to future generations. Without DNA, there is no self-replication. But without self-replication, there is no natural selection. So you can't use natural selection to explain the origin of DNA without assuming the existence of the very thing you're trying to explain. Chance, natural selection, and his own theory of self-organization had all failed to explain the origin of genetic information. Now Kenyon saw only one alternative. We have not the slightest chance of a chemical evolutionary origin for even the simplest uh, of cells. So the concept of the intelligent design of life was immensely attractive to me and made a great deal of sense as it very closely matched the multiple discoveries in molecular biology. In the years since Kenyon's rejection of chemical evolution, Science has revealed the details of an entire system of information processing that bears the hallmarks of intelligent design. With computer animation, we can enter the cell to view this remarkable system at work. After entering the heart of the cell, we see the tightly wound strands of DNA, storehouses for the instructions necessary to build every protein in an organism. In a process known as transcription, a molecular machine first unwinds a section of the DNA helix to expose the genetic instructions needed to assemble a specific protein molecule. 
Another machine then copies these instructions to form a molecule known as messenger RNA. When transcription is complete, the slender RNA strand carries the genetic information through the nuclear pore complex, the gatekeeper for traffic in and out of the cell nucleus. The messenger RNA strand is directed to a two-part molecular factory called a ribosome. After attaching itself securely, the process of translation begins. Inside the ribosome, a molecular assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids. These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell and then linked into chains often hundreds of units long. Their sequential arrangement determines the type of protein manufactured. When the chain is finished, it is moved from the ribosome to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape critical to its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is then released and shepherded by another molecular machine to the exact location where it is needed. This is absolutely mind-boggling to perceive at this scale of size such a uh, finely tuned um, apparatus, a device that's, uh, that bears the marks of intelligent design and manufacture. And we have the details of an immensely complex molecular realm of genetic information processing. And it's exactly this new realm of molecular genetics where we see the most compelling evidence of design on the Earth. When I look at molecular machines or the incredibly complex process by which cells divide, I want to ask, is it possible that these things had an intelligence behind them, that there was a plan or a purpose to this structure? Science ought to be a search for the truth about the world. Now, we shouldn't prejudge what might be true. We shouldn't say, I don't like that explanation, so I'm going to put it to one side. Rather, when we come to a puzzle in nature, we ought to bring to that puzzle every possible cause that might explain it. One of the problems I have with evolutionary theory is it artificially rules out a kind of cause even before the evidence has a chance to speak. And the cause that's ruled out is intelligence. Since the late 19th century, since the time of Darwin, in fact, in part because of Darwin's writing in The Origin of Species, scientists came to con accept a convention, a definition of science that excluded the possibility of design as a scientific explanation. And that convention has a name. It's called methodological naturalism. And it just means that if you're going to be scientific, you must limit yourself to explanations that invoke only natural causes. You can't invoke intelligence as a cause. And yet, curiously, we make inferences to intelligence all the time. It's part of our ordinary reasoning to recognize the effects of intelligence. <laughs> 